So this is chapter 16, writing the research report and the politics of social research. Now, what you'll notice is that the way that the syllabus was organized, all the chapters are in order, except this one. This one's appearing first because, in my very humble opinion, uh, this chapter is very, very important because it's determining or helping you set the stage at least for determining what your final project will be in this class, something that I already want you to be thinking about. So I'm moving this chapter to the very beginning and essentially this chapter deals with two major topics, how to write the report and then the politics of engaging in social research. You know, those who um, and that politics, it's not just like politics like Democrats, Republicans, rather it's people who are trying to uh, push researchers to come up with research results that push one agenda or the other or, um, you know, try to advocate for a certain policy being followed and another one being opposed. This writing of the research report is actually the last step in the research process. Um, it's the end goal. It's the thing that we're going to be building to all the way until the end of the semester. So keep that all in mind. So for the research report itself, um, the process is um, quite complicated and it really begins with one thinking about who the audience is that um, you as the researcher are trying to reach. That right there is going to determine how much sophistication you have in your tone, the complexity of the research topic that, or the research question that you have, um, the motivation that you give for why you think that research question is important, and then the concluding remarks where you demonstrate what one would then do with your research. All of those things are going to be different if you're talking to a community of scholars versus the public versus politicians and policymakers versus your neighbor versus your family members, right? We can imagine that that um, will all determine how much background you have to provide, the detail and sophistication of that background that you need to provide. All of these things are dictating your then style and tone. Your style is going to be, quite simply, it's just what do your words look like, right? Are you using really fancy words that someone always has to look up in the dictionary or are you using quite simple words? And related to that, what does your sentence structure look like? Um, as an academic, not only do we use, well, not only do I use quite long words and quite, um, not only long words, but also just very discipline specific words that maybe only a economist would know, but then also as well, the sentences are quite long, right? You know, that they're not a run-on sentence and that I can have a sentence that is 25, 30 words long. Whereas that is not what you want to be doing if you are um, you know, talking to your neighbor. And that's going to then relate to tone. You know, what is your attitude and your relation to the topic? So the types of words you use and whether you reveal personal feelings or not are going to be dictated by who your audience is. As an academic, when I'm talking to other academics, personal feelings have absolutely no role whatsoever. And it would be very easy for me to hold a differing personal belief than the belief that's being demonstrated by my research, right? Like I could come against the minimum wage, but personally believe that the minimum wage is a good social policy. And once we put that together, we then get to how to organize our thoughts. Organizing the thoughts is probably the most difficult part of this process, and yet it is the most important. And it is a great deal of what we will focus on this class on. You know, how are you going to pick a research topic? How will you approach it? How will you try to test your hypothesis? Um, how do you kind of carry the idea forward and search the literature for um, you know, your thoughts? How will you collect the data if you're doing a quantitative research project? How will you um, conduct interviews if you're doing a qualitative research project? 
And then the final step to this all is going back to the library. Once you have these results, how do you then adjust your, um, your hypothesis? How do you adjust your study? And you go back to the library. It's not only just going back to the library, but just revisiting, rewriting all of your thoughts. You know, and um, you do want to be careful at this point as well then about plagiarism. Uh, special emphasis is given to this topic at this point because um, this would be where you are then, as you're writing up your research results, you're being careful about citation practices and being careful about what others have said and basically citing where you need um, to cite. And then if we go back to looking at the process then of the research report, um, what we see here are, are, are these tasks, I guess you could say, of pre-writing, composing, and then rewriting. Pre-writing, those are kind of like, you know, your notes, your outlines, lists, you know, scribbles, um, you know, freely kind of, um, you know, without citation or anything like that, just basically saying, you know, I've got an idea. And then just writing down kind of like this is the, you know, data source that I'm going to go to to find my results. This is how I think the model would look. This is how I think my argument would exist. Then you get to probably the hardest part, which is writing, composing, what I would almost call is that second bullet point, the second bullet point right here, of doing the first draft. And in that first draft, it's difficult. I mean, uh, the difficulty, the biggest difficulty is just being, um, you know, having a blank page and having to then start writing something. Um, the book talks a little bit about free writing and how you could avoid writer's block. Uh, I mean, I've suffered writer's block a little bit, but not that much. But, you know, everyone is different and I'm not, that's not necessarily a good thing that I haven't suffered too much writer's block. It's not necessarily a... A good thing or a bad thing it's just the way that it is um, you know and one of the suggestions is you just start writing down your thoughts freely um, probably one of the reasons why I don't suffer too much from writer's block is that I absolutely with 100% certainty know that anytime I'm writing something I am not just sending it off that first draft I am writing and writing and rewriting and rewriting and so something that seems complex and daunting like a blank page is no longer complex because or difficult because I'm not going to let it out of my hands and out of my eyes until it's in a more finished form. And that's where we're then talking about revising and editing. Revising and editing is really where a lot of the value of the article um, or the research topic comes out. This isn't just fixing your verb tense or run-on sentences or anything like that. It's also just rethinking what your research project is now that you've had time to think about everything. And then if you look at box 16.2 on page 548, you then see those suggestions for rewriting of the things then to think about. Mechanics, usage of voice, coherence, repetition, structure, abstraction, and metaphors. But I also would add to that then, I think a very more, uh, something I want you to everyone to keep in their mind for the rewriting processes. Do I need to go back and rethink what that research project was, what that research question was? You know, it might look quite different than how you originally thought it would look before you started writing everything out. Now, how that research report looks is going to be different depending on whether you're doing a quantitative or a qualitative report. If we're looking at a quantitative report, then the abstract is generally quite short, 50 to 100 words. The executive summary um, generally is in much more detail. It's an extended abstract, and generally that could be up to a page. Then what you want to do in that quantitative research report would be present the problem. This is the research topic that I'm looking at, and this is why I think it's important to understand. Then I want to know what did you do to try to answer that question, right? What kind of study did you do? What kind of data did you collect? How did you get this data? Do we think that this data is something that we can trust, is telling us what is actually going on? You know, did you take a sample? Did you take a population sample? 
who did you interview? You know, why do we think that these individuals that you interviewed are representative of the entire whole? Then I want to see the numbers, right? I want to see the data. Now, this is a little bit hard because you want to be careful when you're reviewing results and tables that you don't want to just flood the reader with lots and lots and lots of charts and relationships that you think exist. You want to use the minimum of results and tables. And a good practice now is that though you also make the data set available to researchers so that if they wanted to play around with the data and they wanted to even replicate your results, that they could. Then you have your discussion. Uh, essentially what you want to do is you want to be, you know, it's free of your personal thoughts, it's concise, um, you're just giving an interpretation or meaning to the data. Did it just, did it um, um, nullify or verify your hypothesis? How does the data do that for you? And then you've got your concluding remarks. Now, related to that as well, then, would be your qualitative research reports. Now, here, this is a little bit more difficult because you're not um, using a data set where you're just going to talk about the, re you know, say this is the research, this is the report, um, the data that I looked at, this is how I, um, why I think it's valuable data, and then here are what the results are. For qualitative research, well, there's lots of different ways that one can do qualitative or non-numeric research. Now, the two kind of things we could look at here, first with um, field research, right? We've got some things that one needs to be concerned about. Um, this would be, first, this error of segregation. You want to be able to present some data in such a way that it's close enough to the analysis. But then you can kind of see then as well that the organization, you know, introduction, situation, strategy, summary, implementation, it's a little bit, as the, as the title suggests, is a little bit looser or there's a little bit less structure to what's going on. But a typical strategy of one one uh, of what I've seen a lot of individuals do in qualitative research is they use typically a zoom lens. And that means starting at a 30,000 or 50,000 foot level, right, talking about this is what's going on for African American males in the United States, but then you're focusing on African American males that live in a certain suburb of Philadelphia, right? So you're going down to a more specific group, or you could even just talk about one problem that African American males face in the United States. Now, um, we then also have the historical comparative research, and a good discussion of all of these parts here is, uh, if, if you look at this, is on page 555. I thought it did a pretty good um, description of these. I don't want to just waste time by repeating something that you can um, that you can read here. Now, what I want you to be thinking about, both with this slide and with this slide, is you probably are already starting. You probably already know what kind of researcher you would want to be or what your discipline says you would be, whether you are a quantitative or a qualitative person. So I already want you to kind of start focusing on what kind of person you are. Now you'll be responsible for understanding both, but again, for the research report, um, you'll want to have some understanding um, of one more than the other. Now, what we know here for the research proposal itself is that um, the reason why research proposals are so important and in some sense why this course is only focused on how do you write a good research proposal is that you got to get the money to do it and the way that you get money is by right because you can't do the project until you have the money is that you're basically telling someone with money your patron right that you have a good research idea you think this is why it's important you think these might be the results you get, but you don't know, and this is how much it's going to cost to do it. It's the whole strategy and skill set then to getting grants, or what we call grantsmanship. Um, and that what the granting agencies typically do is they make a request for a proposal, right? So they'll say, we want all research that's on African-American males facing problems in the United States. Right? Then I, as a principal investigator, would say, I have this research project that looks at 
how many African-American males in a suburb of Philadelphia go to college? And if they don't go to college, what are the reasons why they didn't go to college, right? So now I've got an idea. I had some data and demonstrated them to my grant. Uh, what do we see that good research proposals do? Uh, well, the biggest, biggest, biggest thing is really that they have a good research question. Is the question interesting? Do they have a way then to answer that question in a realistic way? Then actually, second, if I'm looking at this as a person, I then look at their experience second. I want to see, does this person have the skill set needed to answer that question. Have they done it before in other research projects? Do they have a training that would suggest they know what they're doing? Now you would see that as well in their um, methods. Are they of quality? Um, you know, uh, is what they're doing reasonable? Um, obviously I want them following the instructions that I as the grant maker have asked them to, to, to follow. Some agencies are a little bit more strict than others. But then also too, I'm going to probably be concerned with, right, did you, the number, the amount of money that you're asking for, is it in line with what is needed to actually do the project? You say you're going to do it in a certain amount of time. Is that actually realistic of what you're going to be able to do? And then finally, well, and, I shouldn't say finally, but I also would want to see then some way in which you're going to publish what you did or show to others what you did and what your research results are. And as the grant maker, I want you to say, hey, and the Shiting Foundation gave me money to answer this question, right? Because I'm, as the grant maker, am looking for some um, credit as well. Now, there is a politics to research, and the politics to research limits what one can do research on. Now, some of this, um, and I've actually published some research actually on this as well. Um, if anyone's interested, um, you can ask me for the reference um, of the article I wrote or for really for any other articles. Um, but it, sometimes it's politicians saying they just don't want you to do research on certain topics. Um, the book talks a little bit about Project Camelot, which was where um, in Chile there was a dictatorship and the CIA was involved, and the CIA wanted to sponsor research that allowed that um, Chilean dictatorship to, to, um, to prosper. Uh, the one that just came out, actually just out in the news just about a month ago, was actually one on psychologists and the waterboarding of terrorism suspects um, at Guantanamo Bay and how psychologists um, were basically being pushed by, obviously, by politicians to um, justify or to approve of waterboarding techniques by those who were um, psychologists. And then related to that as well, then we've got this idea that um, Sometimes people ask for research to be done, but they earmark it or what's called pork barrel it, meaning that you get certain research done because a politician says, I want more research done on X and I want it to be done at XYZ institution. And in fact, if you look at the book, if anyone's reading the book very closely, you actually see that University of Hawaii is uh, number seven on that list. That's not necessarily a good thing. It means they're getting money, but it might mean that Hawaiian scholars are not getting it on their merit, rather that they are buddy-buddy with a politician, or that the politician wants to bring a lot of money back to, um, you know, uh, back to the state of Hawaii or, or to whatever institution um, we're talking about here. And sometimes what we also see as well is that the government might place limits um, over the research funding, right, that they might not want. Uh, the debate we have uh, more recently would be some things about like fetal tissue, right? Like if I was doing research on aborted fetuses um, and I was using their body parts to do that research, well, that's obviously a political hot topic. It's a social hot topic. And I might see some limits on my funding and my ability to do certain things and um, to use um, that body matter, right? Because I might not think it's right as a politician. I might not think it's right as a society that I'm doing that. Or we had that also with what if I was doing research on genetic, uh, genetically modified uh, crops, right? Or seeds, that kind of thing. 
And then we see also some limits to dissemination of research uh, with slap, last, uh, slap suits. These are uh, lawsuits that are filed basically to stop people from um, giving public testimony about why they think a certain thing about a certain topic or usually it's about, you know, if I were to say Apple computers are, you know, give people cancer, then probably the Apple computer company might have a slap suit on me to stop me from revealing my research that shows that using an Apple computer will give you cancer. Now, when we talk about the ways in which these findings are disseminated, then we have a set of ideal ways that social researchers basically understand how research is conducted and how those research results should be used. Um, here we have that those relevance, um, those areas of relevance would be that there are no net effects, that there are both direct and positive effects, but that sometimes also we're talking about it being relevant to the public, um, in this case the special constituency of the proletariat, or we could have it to the special constituency of the uncoopted, or the special constituency of the government. And then sometimes as well I'm writing it because I'm writing it on behalf of a think tank. A think tank is an organization that's basically devoted to thinking about things broadly under a certain topic. So I could have like a conservative thinking think tank, um, right, that would be Republican ideas of limited government and, um, you know, social values. So then I could get together some conserv uh, conservative scholars of thought that would come up with certain ideas that they would then publish. And then when we think about the post-publication process, then what we want to look at then is where does the research go next? How much ability did I have to then share uh, what my beliefs were? Was I scared that someone else was going to stop my beliefs? And then finally, we have um, objectivity and value freedom. Am I giving beliefs that, uh, or am I able to talk about my research in a way that is free of my own personal values, that is generally objective? Okay, so that completes chapter 16. Um, you should read the book for more detail. Really what I'm trying to do in uh, by adding the narration is just kind of going a little bit beyond the slides here.